Paul Crenshaw, Associate Professor of Art History, and together with my co-organizers, Laurie Group, Associate Professor of Education <laughs> and Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence, <laughs> and Jill LaPointe, direct, uh, Associate Athletic Director and Senior Woman Administrator. <laughs> We're pleased to have you here at this community forum on athletics and academics, especially considering how tempting it is to be outdoors. The forum is sponsored by the Center for Teaching Excellence, the Athletic Department, and the Department of Art and Art History. It may not be immediately clear why art and art history is intimately involved with this endeavor. We were prompted by one of today's panelists, Trustee Kathy Burt, uh, to um, curate an exhibition on the theme of sports and art. We took the idea and ran with it, and Kathy has been there as our lead runner all the way to the finish line. Our semester-long theme of sport, art, identity encompasses two exhibitions and a host of initiatives that found us collaborating with nearly 20 departments across the campus. The two exhibitions are a lithograph series by Joseph Norman titled Out at Home, the Negro Baseball League in the Riley Gallery, Smith Center for the Arts, and the Student Sports Photography Exhibition in the Hunt Cavanaugh Gallery. These shows are open through this Thursday, so if you haven't had the pleasure of visiting the galleries, I hope you'll find the time to do so shortly. Also this Thursday and next, we have the, the uh, final two presentations in our film series. Please take one of our brochures, they're available at the doorway and we can pass more around if you like, uh, that detail all of our programming from the semester on the theme of sport and art. Our collaboration with the athletic department has been rewarding all year long, and our programs demonstrate that <laughs> athletics can be a vital component of our academic endeavors. My favorite moment of the semester came at the opening of the student sports photography exhibition, when I overheard several of the athletes complimenting one of our photographers on his skills and congratulating him for his accomplishments. Go Fry Artists. <laughs> From March Madness to NCAA scandals of various sorts to the rapidly shifting landscape in recruiting that is sweeping up younger and younger people into stress-filled situations long before they reach maturity, enormous pressures are brought to bear on athletes in our society. Dialogues about the role of athletics are taking place on many college campuses, and while some of, the, some of these issues transcend our uh, ability to provide unilateral solutions, we will nonetheless try to find our place in these national conversations as they relate to the athletic, academic, social, and personal experience of our student athletes at Providence College. Our speakers for today's community forum will bring their own perspectives and insights, of course, but we also invited them as representatives of particular constituencies that support our student athletes at PC, administrators, faculty, advisors, parents, and peers. I've been tossing around a modified cliche, it takes a village to raise an athlete these days. The brief statements by our panelists will help frame the discussion period to follow. We aim not only to raise awareness and open dialogues, but also to encourage productive engagement and to prompt takeaways for new directions that might be considered in order to best fulfill the Providence College mission that calls for, our, for holistic, intellectual, social, moral, and spiritual growth of all of our students. I'll now turn over the podium to Lori to introduce our speakers. Thank you. So our first speaker is Melissa McGow from the class of 2007, women's field hockey and a psychology major. Melissa? Thank you. Um, to start off with the basics, a little bit more about myself. As mentioned, I graduated from Providence College in 2007. While here, I played field hockey under the direction of head coach Diane Maddell. I majored in psychology and I minored in the business studies program. Um, upon graduating from Providence College, I went directly to law school at Roger Williams University, which is actually the sole law school here in Rhode Island. I graduated from there in 2010 as valedictorian of my class. Um, from there, I got the honor of clerking in Providence um, in the Rhode Island Supreme Court for Chief Justice Paul Sattel. 
My clerkship concluded this past fall, at which time I moved to Boston, where I'm now a corporate finance lawyer for the law firm of Proskauer Rhodes. In getting this opportunity to reflect upon my experiences here at Providence College as a student athlete, overall, I can honestly say it was one of the most remarkable and influential experiences of my life thus far, and it has definitely shaped who I am as a person. Um, and speaking first to the athletic piece, physically, you're pushed way beyond any limits you thought you could achieve prior to coming to college. I mean, day in, day out, you go through a physical grind, and it can be grueling. But by the end of my four years here, I think I was able to achieve a physical fitness and athletic um, abilities that not only were very physically healthy, but that also made me very mentally confident and very mentally comfortable. And I think that's something very important, especially to women of the college age. And I don't think you get that necessarily unless you go through something as grueling as this. And I always know that I can attain that physical comfort and everything. And I think that's very important and carries into all aspects of life, that comfort and confidence. Um, in addition to that, on the playing field, when I came here, we were rebuilding my field hockey program, um, and there was definitely a lot of battles and stresses and everything, but by the end of my four years, we were able to achieve great success, and that's definitely something that you never forget. That feeling of accomplishment after so much hard work and everything, you, create, you feel such a personal joy and personal like natural high that you want to achieve that feeling than in other aspects of life. I now constantly find myself seeking that feeling, whether it be in work, whether it be in a personal relationship. And it's kind of instilled and harbored in me this underlying driving force to achieve. And I think that's something that athletics can definitely provide to everyone, that feeling of accomplishment. As far as the academic part, for me personally, I don't think I understood my whole experience as a student here until I went to graduate school. At law school, basically going in, I was warned it was going to be the, fir the first year was going to be the worst year of my life. And it was. I'm not going <laughs> to, it was not fun. But I actually was able to thrive that year because of the student I had unknowingly become here at Providence College. Um, first, as opposed to a lot of my classmates, I went to class and I paid attention because that's all I knew how to do. I think athletes get a bad rep for when they're traveling, missing class and everything. And the truth of the matter is, you do have to miss class. But when you're here, you're taught that you go to class and you pay attention and you're held responsible and you face repercussions if you don't, which other people don't face necessarily. And that habit stayed with me, and it was completely beneficial. In addition to that, when you're an athlete here, you're up at 6 a.m. for practice or whatever it may be, and you're studying in study hall late at night, and you're studying at whatever time you need to during the day to get the job done. And so I had become so disciplined in time management and the day in, day out regiment that was instilled in me but that by the time I got to law school, that schedule was only natural. And other people didn't handle the demands as well and couldn't function from early in the morning to late at night working hard on their own disciplined schedule. And I think having that instilled in me is something that by far let me succeed that year and throughout graduate school. With that said, an interesting component I did find in graduate school with the balance of athletics and academics is I found that when I finally had the time to focus just on athletic, uh, just on academics rather, um, without the athletic restrictions and demands and that part of the time being taken, but still having the disciplines from athletics, I was able to go the extra mile and to achieve maybe slightly better grades than I had. But at the same time, I instantly found myself maybe not achieving as much in life. I didn't feel like I had that energy that I naturally had while I was here with the physical outlet and everything that athletics can provide. I didn't feel like I had the balance in my life, the natural happiness and the variety and all that. So before I knew it, I was kind of craving that and already putting myself back on a schedule to incorporate all that and taking my own time away. So. I think that that balance is something very important. And as I go into the working world, I only find that it's, it's part of everyday life more, that you're expected to balance and really excel at both areas and different areas. So I think getting that opportunity to practice that in college and getting used to it and handling everything is only extremely beneficial. Um, as far as institutional apparatuses that I found helpful, Providence College is so unique in that I feel like it's such a close-knit community as a whole and especially the like, athletic department on top of that is a very close-knit community. And when you have support from everyone, it really makes what you do more rewarding and it encourages you to work harder. And I think that's really important. Having teachers and all parts of the community really coming out to support you and all the hard work you're putting into different things is great and it really keeps you going. Um, I think my coaches, I mean, were beyond words. They're the second mothers, the constant motivators, um, the holding you responsible role models and everything that every athlete should have and me, really every student I think should have in some type of person and so getting that I think is wonderful and is very important at that influential stage of your life um, and I don't think that should be overlooked because I do know other student athletes at different schools that don't have the same experiences and it can be influential 
Um, in addition, I personally found that things like, I know that some classes were recorded for things like Civ and everything, and I was able to take advantage of that. And I think, again, as I mentioned, like it's not a matter of doing the work. Student athletes want to do the work. It's just having all the resources available for them to make up the classes they might miss or do things like that so that they can go that extra mile and really fit everything in and making it fit their schedule. Um, finally, I mean, study hall, while it's grueling and while you're in it, you don't want to be there, it, it teaches you such great time management and discipline that I don't think can be undermined. And I almost think it's something that every student should have to go through. And I think it's a pro that, that student athletes get that experience and discipline and that should be encouraged. So I know my time is running here. So I just want to say overall, I mean, the disciplines and values instilled in you from student being a student athlete here are incredible and definitely last way beyond your time here. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Now we have Dino Stimulus, class of 2007, men's ice hockey and a marketing major. Wow, how do you follow that up? <laughs> um, I don't want to rehash everything that Melissa just said, so uh, I think the best thing to do is to be honest about my experience and what it was like being a student athlete here. Um, I graduated with a marketing degree in 07, and when I was asked to do this little speech here, I thought to myself, wow, what was my life like as a student athlete? Because it went so fast. And I think that it gave me a, a couple hours to kind of digest how I came into this college and how, how the atmosphere was different here. And one thing that I can really say helped me after leaving school was the close-knit dynamic and the, the hands-on treatment that you get from a lot of the coaches, faculty, and staff. I think that as a hockey player, you're looked at as a leader, but you're also looked at as a slacker in, in the sense in the classroom. So it's like when I came into school, my goal was I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit in front of every teacher. I'm going to be the first one there. And my first year here, I struggled, a, a big time struggle. And it was that year, I think, that made me who I am because it was a sink or swim atmosphere. And looking back on it, I thought, wow, if I can survive that and I can balance my hockey with my academics, then the sky's the limit when I leave. And since leaving, what I did was I graduated in 2007, played professional hockey for three years, and then in 2010, retired from professional hockey and ended up um, looking for a job, actually. I started looking for a job, and with the economy downturn, everything was kind of up in the air. So I figured, I got the skills. I went to Providence College, started a business. So a, a year ago from December, uh, my wife and I started a granola company and kind of haven't looked back since. And I think that relating that to my academic experience, um, I can say that without a doubt, if I hadn't gone to class and I hadn't paid attention, I would be a lost puppy right now because there are so many things that come your way once you leave Providence College that if you don't have the foundation and you don't have the academic side of it and you're just focused on your athletics, you're, you're, you're bound to fail. And I think that for me, Failing was never an option, and, and as other, my other classmates would attest to this, when we played here, we played under two different coaching staffs, and um, we struggled as, as a hockey team as well. But we always looked to one another for that guidance, that comfort, and that ability to move on and push through adversity. So moving forward, if I could, if I could say one thing about what I really enjoyed is the fact that I can always come back here and I can always know people from here on a first name basis. And my, my hockey career was, was my main focal point coming in, but throughout the years of me playing and being a student athlete, I noticed that the balance started to shift. And so for other student athletes sitting in the room, I would think that, you know, you may be saying, yeah, 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 what, you know, I want to play, I want to play, or I want to play pro. Well, let me tell you something. As you go up the ladder, it gets a lot more competitive, and it doesn't become something that's fun. And while I was at school, 
I had the most fun in my entire career. And once you leave school, it's all about the money. So enjoy your time here as a student athlete, embrace academics, and never look back. I just want you to know that we didn't tell people what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Next, we have Catherine Littlebert, a member of the Providence College Board of Trustees. Hello. Providence College has greatly influenced my development, shaping my intellectual, my personal, and my spiritual life. When I first entered Aquinas Hall and listened to a Robert Deasy's Western Civ lecture on the Peloponnesian War, it was like being sprinkled with pixie dust. Quickly, I was sucked into the magical world of discovery and knowledge. Of course, midterms quickly broke that spell and brought me to the reality that to acquire and maintain knowledge required rigor and discipline. It was the academics at this college that pushed me over the line, gave me that aha moment that life would be pretty boring beyond age 21 if I did not seek out a rich and challenging intellectual life for the future. When I entered alumni gym and tried out for the women's softball team, it was more like the experience of being struck by lightning. Helen Burt ushered me into the world of serious sport. Nothing but hard work, excellence, and fierce competition was accepted on the field. And winning, while not essential, was pretty darn important. Title IX had passed in 1972, and PC female athletes had to make up for lost opportunities. By the time I graduated in 1977, Helen had negotiated scholarships for women athletes, started multiple women's intercollegiate sports, and mentored me while I worked in the Women's Center into the world of budgets, creative financing, and strategic political detente. In my four-year Providence College tenure, graduating as a psychology major, like Melissa, under the tutelage of Drs. Raymond, Dr. Lamb, and Dr. Bozak, my academics became more refined and specialized, gaining me acceptance into the graduate program at the University of Connecticut. During that same four-year tenure, my athletics became more expansive, adding field hockey and volleyball to my varsity sports and introducing me to a wider and more diverse PC student population beyond the psychology <coughs> department. And it is the marriage of those two worlds, academics and sports, mediated by the moral compass of a Dominican education that became my most valuable asset to enter into the real world beyond the protected boundaries of a college campus. Now, fast forward 30 years, I am the owner of an art gallery here in Providence specializing in 19th century American painting and came onto the Board of Trustees in 2010 on the Athletic and the Student Affairs Committee. A relatively new trustee, I've been involved over the past two months in the collaborative effort of sport art with the Athletic Department and the Art and Art History Department. This has been a tremendous experience for me and an opportunity to work closely with both departments and see firsthand the dynamic of the Providence College campus today. I am so impressed with the hard work and dedication of both the art and art history department and the athletic department, this forum being one of the results of that collaboration. Providence College faces tremendous challenges today. How to advance in a very competitive collegiate arena with a small endowment. How to share a rich tradition of a Dominican college, attract the best students, and provide a safe and stimulating environment. I feel very optimistic about the future of this college, from the leadership of Father Shanley to the quality, creativity, and thoughtfulness of its students, its athletes, faculty, administration, and trustees. Change 
provides an opportunity for this college. And it's a pleasure to be here at this moment in time, in this room, to discuss and to debate as Providence College moves forward to embrace its destiny. Thank you. Please welcome Jonathan Gomes, Associate Director for Academic Services. Thank you. Where, where can I start? Our student athletes testimonial. I, I wish that a lot more of our student athletes were here to hear their story because it's real. It's real for them. And what I can tie into that is, is that balance to really help our student athletes understand the importance of finding balance. Balance in their academic lives, balance in their academic lives. There's many times that I'll have student athletes that will come through my door and really um, have concerns about how they're being perceived by their professors. And it takes some time for my staff and I to really coach and mentor our student athletes to find that connection find that means that they can approach a professor with confidence, the same confidence that they display on their field of choice that they play in their particular sport. But it really hits home when you hear two of our student athletes that have come through the process. Um, what I would really love to see is that opportunity to continue where we invite many more of our student athletes back to speak with our current class because our student athletes need to hear those stories. Those stories are stories that they can definitely relate to. That's significant um, for all of us. As faculty and staff members, um, having that opportunity to pull these students in from the connections that they've made with our faculty, professors, and teachers, to invite them back into class to speak not only to our student athletes, but also to our students that are here that are doing other activities representing our university well. Um, so f for me and for our office, or my office, that balance is significant for our student athletes. And any means that we can continue to help that process now from early on as our freshmen leading up to our senior class um, would be welcomed. Um, I appreciate the time for you to listen to me, and thank you. And next we have Peg Ruggieri, Assistant Professor of Accountancy, Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Studies, and Director of Academic Advising. Hi. Um, I'm here today with three hats on. Um, so I was going to make some observations as a faculty member, the Director of Academic Advising, and also the parent of two college athletes. One is a graduate of PC. As far as a faculty member, now I have witnessed um, Many students, hardworking student athletes like the two, the three that we have here today. Um, I also want to bring up some other types of observations as a faculty member. Um, I have found that some student athletes don't identify themselves as athletes in class. And you might ask why, and I'm afraid that some feel that they're stereotyped. For example, when there was bad press regarding PC athletics, I asked my student athletes in class that day, how did that make you feel? And they admitted feeling that many people assume all athletes exhibit bad behavior. And I have heard some colleagues comment, well, they are athletes, what do you expect? My response is, we should expect the same level of standard of excellence of all our students. As the student athletes talked about, they are developing transferable skills the passion, the discipline, the hard work, the intelligence, the problem solving skills that you need to be successful in the classroom are those same kind of skills you need to be successful on the field, on the court, in the pool, on the ice. Another observation, um, some student athletes I have found are proud of their academic success while the others are embarrassed by it. I contacted a coach when I had two student athletes in my class who exemplified what a student athlete is all about. And um, I found out that the coach read the email to the students, and they both happened to be advisees of mine. And when I found out about it, I said, oh, how did that make you feel? Now, one told me it embarrassed her. The other one said, it made my day. 
So very interesting there. So I feel that a challenge that we have is how can we, what can we do to help promote a culture where our students take pride in academic success, whether you're a student athlete or all our students. Observations as a parent. As a parent, I witness firsthand the demands that the athletes here have talked about. They have a 40 hour plus week schedule as an athlete and a 40 hour plus week as a student, I'm hoping. Um, but I witnessed all that and just the strong uh, time management skills that it requires. As a parent, I also witness some discrimination against athletes regarding classroom policies that put athletes at a disadvantage regarding excused travel absences. On the other hand, I also witnessed departments, academic departments celebrating the accomplishment of my daughters by posting up articles on them, getting emails from professors and other people in the community. I've also witnessed as a parent the development of wonderful leadership skills that um, being a student athlete promote. And I also observe that, um, I happen to have twin daughters, so I saw two different institutions. Um, Julie was here at PC and Danielle was at Davidson. And we have so much more built-in support, safety nets for our student athletes, people like Jonathan Gomes, that they didn't have at Davidson. As director of academic advising, I see the tug and pull between athletics and academics. Athletics and academics can be two worlds apart. Often the student athletes are caught in the tug of war. Advising is a tough one. Coaching staff, the coaching staff in some cases trumps academic advice. Some athletes have not developed a sound relationship with faculty, but have with the coaching staff, so they go to who they know. Now I doubt that Coach Cooley wants any advice, coaching advice from me. I was JV basketball captain, but I don't think that's going to do a lot. But faculty feel the same way about um, academic advice. So, um, and the other thing that we notice, I notice as director of academic advising, that some student athletes, uh, present company excluded, I think, are not as engaged in the academic planning process of their educational experience as they could be. So one, uh, actually, one uh, program that we're just instituting this semester, which was developed by uh, Dr. Pat Evanchuk, who's here today, is a team advising program. We're piloting it with four of the athletic teams, and we have volunteer faculty members who are going to do pre and post advising to help those athletes get more prepared for their meetings with their regular faculty advisor, to promote, to help them understand the responsibility that they have to be engaged in their educational experience. And which I think will foster relationship with the athletes so that they have more direct relation, uh, relationship with the academic community. And I just, my final comment is, um, I hope we have more celebrations of athletics and academics. I was so happy this semester when um, I went to the, uh, I was fortunate enough to be with a group of accounting students, I'm on the accounting faculty, um, that won a national championship down in New York. And I was at the Louisville game the next night, and I hear it announced at the Louisville basketball game, and I hear it announced, and then during the UConn game, those students were honored. So I thought that was wonderful, doing, uh, honoring both athletics and academics together. Thank you. We're also happy to have with us today Coach Cooley from the men's basketball program. Well, I love those two games you both were with because we won both of them, so come back. <laughs> we come, you know, come back to all of them. It is, uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate all you coming today and allowing me to be part of this. As I am still learning more about uh, what Providence College is, what I do appreciate more than anything is the effort to try to always come together. There are a lot of differences and I think open forums like this uh, could really help me as a coach, me as a representative of Providence College, but help me help our kids, not just our basketball players, but our entire Providence College community. And every day I wake up, I think of us, we, together, family, friars. And as a, what is our role? What is my role? My role on a national scale is to brand our college in places that's never been done before. 
the role of television in the Big East. It has such a, uh, you know, high, high level visibility. Um, even going down, I was in a small, small little town in South Carolina, and I saw a young man with a Providence College hat on, probably from 19 whatever, but he was really proud to wear that. He, I don't know if he knew we were coming, but he showed up. And I said, well, I looked at Bob Simon, who was with me on that particular assignment. I said, this is what this is all about. For our young men that come to the college, I hear them complain about everything. Many of our student athletes are incredibly spoiled and entitled. And that's the balance we have to have where we become a father, a teacher, a role model. Many of our young men on the basketball side are first generation students. So their survival may not be in the classroom. Their survival may be learning how to just walk on a college campus. Where do they fit in? Who am I? Who looks like me? So I think the role of college athletics also brings diversity into play, which is very, very important. I went to Stonehill College as one, it was one of two black males on campus. The only diversity at that campus. I was a raisin in a gallon of milk. <laughs> and I was petrified, petrified. Over the years of coaching, I've had kids in the office crying because they're nervous to go to class. Now, we have a long way to go to mend a lot of fences. We have to teach our kids how to learn. Some of them have to learn how to learn. Some of these kids, we have to give opportunity. I'm a first generation college graduate. If a school didn't give me an opportunity, I can't stand in front of you today. But this is where the entitlement and giving our kids roles and holding them accountable and letting them know that they have to be part of our community. They can't be in their own little shell and say, I'm just a whatever player. You have to go out and become different. Go out and introduce yourself. Become part of a different, uh, different part of the community. I tell our players, the professors are the head coach of that classroom. You respect it as such, your body language, your preparation, your eye contact, your, 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 your skills to want to learn. Some kids come to this level on the basketball side and think they're pros. For our group, I tell them, did they look at our record? <laughs> I talked to one of our players today about the importance of wanting to graduate. Don't come here like we ha you have to graduate. You have to want to do that. As a young student athlete, I wanted to graduate. I wanted to make my parents proud. I wanted to make our community proud. I wanted to become something. And for some of our players and for some of our student athletes here, they may not have that drive. They may not have that drive. So as a coach and as a leader and someone of our community who I absolutely love, there's no other place in the world I'd rather be rather than right here at this podium on this campus is sometimes our kids just don't know. They haven't been educated as such. And as we go into the recruiting world, we do everything we can to find a young man who fits, but someone who doesn't fit, we try to encourage them that they can come here and be special. So it's a really, really delicate balance. And sometimes you have to be a tough dad with these kids. Sometimes you do. But it, I think in the end, you hear stories of fulfillment, of gratitude, appreciation. And that's where we know we've done our job. In a very small period of time, I have found such a loving group of individuals at this school. And this is the fourth Catholic school that I've worked at. There's none better. There's none better. The love, the compassion, it, you, you try to help everybody, but sometimes everyone can't be helped. Let's help those that want to get help first, educate those in one second, and for those who want to go to the wayside, say a prayer for them and good luck to them. That's really how I feel, because you can only try and try so much. So a, from a community standpoint, I think athletics plays an incredible role in developing a college on a men's side, on the basketball side, because of the national recognition that we receive as a brand, Providence College. Thank you. And next we have Bob Driscoll, Associate Vice President for Athletics and Athletic Director. Thank you. I, I don't know why I always get to follow you, Ed. It's not, you know, it's not fair, man. Ebony and I were you know? <laughs> I, uh, you know, the fact that we're having this forum here is an indication of what makes Providence College great. I will promise you this doesn't happen at other campuses around the, the nation. It's something we really, really should be proud of. And to Dino and, and Melissa, when I, when I heard you speak, 
you know, these young men and women are the models of what we're trying to create. And it's, it doesn't happen by accident. These young men and women work their tails off, but I bet if I asked them to, ask, to give me the three pillars of our vision that they could do it. it it's, not a, it's not a mistake that these young men and women are so successful. And what I wanted to do was kind of put in context what we're trying to achieve here at Providence College. And this has been in place for about 10 years. And we have talked about this almost daily with our student athletes and my coaches. And my job is to coach the coaches. And Ed is a perfect example of a teacher and a mentor and a coach. And I have other coaches that are just like Ed. And they have the interaction with our student athletes on a daily basis that really makes a difference. Father and I talk a lot about why do we have Division I athletics here at Providence College. And it's because of the life skills and values you learn through competition. You know, when you lose a tough game or you don't want to get up in the morning, you fly home at 3 o'clock in the morning and Ed said, hey, get your butt to class at 8 o'clock in the morning. Not everybody does that. But you know that those are the mental toughness skills that are going to allow you to be successful. It's, it's not about winning and losing. It's about, it's about battling every day. And Dino talked about that. He went through two different coaches, didn't have a lot of success. But he was, he's a successful young man because he learned how to be mentally tough and work through that. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the three core pillars that we're trying to create. Number one, we want to be the most respected program in the nation. Now, we'll have student athletes get in trouble, and that will taint the, the view of all of us out here. But the vast majority of our student athletes are great young men and women. We need to put that into context. And when I talk about that, it's the little things. It's how you dress. It's how you walk. Do you show up on time? Do you look people in the eye? Do you shake their hands? It's about their calling card. You got one chance to make a first impression. And that needs to be taught. And Ed is doing that as are my student athletes are doing that as well. Number two, we talk about 100% graduation. This is important to us. There's not a student at Providence College that shouldn't graduate from Providence College. And the thing that I'm really proud about, we graduate between 92 and 94% of our student athletes in a five-year period. I promise you that's in the top 1% of the nation. And when you consider the fact that we're in the toughest basketball conference in the nation, the Big East, and the toughest hockey conference in the nation, in Hockey East, you're competing at an elite level. Our student athletes and the professors know you've got to go to class. There are programs we compete against, I promise you, they don't go to class. That's, a two, that's two full-time jobs, and that's important to us. We had over 53%, I think, had 3.0 or better this past fall. We had 22% on the dean's list. That's an important figure. And lastly, we talk about competing for championships. It's not about winning the championship. It's about competing for the championship. And every one of my student athletes walks around and they have one of these little wristbands on. I wear it to bed, much to the chagrin of my wife, but on it it says, every day is game day. And what we mean by that is when you go to class or when you go to practice, bring your very best energy every single day. You know the energy you have when you're playing a game? You're fired up. But what's it like when you get up and it's snowing and it's cold and it's miserable and you don't want to go there? It's about building mental toughness. So what we're trying to create, and it's a tough task because it's a, it's a competitive world out there. We're trying to create the model program. And I think we can do that here because of the Dominican influence, because of the education, because we're small, because we're a family, and because we have great people. We have great coaches, we have great students, we have great faculty. But what I'd like to see have happen moving forward is that we do it more cohesively. And I'll take a better leadership role in building those bridges, and I would hope you'd be our teammates, because I think we can do something very, very special. So I just want to say thank you for all that you have done, and thank you for everything we'll do moving forward. Go Friars. John Sweeney, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Thank you. I uh, appreciate being here. I think one of my roles, or my role at this college, is trying to help everybody achieve their goals. And whether it's in the classroom or in supporting the students in the residence hall or on the athletic playing fields, it's really finding the resources and supporting them in a way that balances resources in order to be successful. This is the uh, third athletic program that I worked with closely. The first one was at the University of Connecticut and specifically involved in the upgrade of, to Division I football. The second was a, a very successful Division III. And the third is here. Um, and I really appreciate what goes on here because of 
the ability that we are small and the ability to affect change and to impact either in a negative or a positive way can really be felt by a relatively small number. So that gives us opportunities and it gives us challenges. When you look at what Bob talked about in competing in Big East and in Hockey East, when you look at the, we're the smallest institution in a major conference. Wake Forest has 7,000, that's the smallest ACC between graduate and undergrad. Rice has over 6,000. So all of those are more than almost a couple of thousand larger than us, and we're competing on that playing field. I see a lot of challenges in college sports, uh, saturation of sports, a real move at many institutions to isolate the athletes away from their fellow. And this is a real change where the NCAA 25 years ago used to want to integrate student athletes into the general population. Now the whole track in college sports is to move away the student athletes from the student population. You can't do that in a place like Providence College. And I think that's a very good thing and a thing that will help our student athletes and help our student population. We're expanding practice schedules, expanding schedules. The volleyball program starts coming back to campus in the beginning of August. The soccer plays games the third week of August. We're extended seasons. We're playing off-season, expanded off-season schedules. And that's putting a, a challenge, that's a challenge to the student athlete, not only physically but mentally, and also challenges college resources in being able to open residence halls and provide meals and all the other stuff so early. So those are some of the challenges. The problem we have is how do you compete successfully? How can you influence things really in a way where you cannot necessarily do things unilaterally? We're in Division One, but Division One. The real other aspect of it is two-thirds of our student athletes are, are not on scholarship. Or another way, we have a full-time equivalent scholarships of about 129, <coughs> and we have well over 350 student athletes. So many of the students are coming here to participate in the sport, and only 92 full scholarships, the rest are partial. Some are very, very partial and some none at all. So what draws student athletes here is to be part of Providence College. And it's an important recruiting when you're recruiting students an admission part process is to sports attract students to come here, whether it's to participate or whether to be part of the environment and culture that has competitive sports. One of the things that Division Two, the reason why, I mean, excuse me, Division Three that we ran sports programs, it was part of an enrollment strategy. And if you look at the student athletes here that are not on scholarship, that generates more than $11 million in revenue. Now it doesn't offset all the expenses, but one of the things, the fact is we lose sight of, while we spend six million, six and a half million dollars in scholarships, which is a, a way of opportunity, many of which these, the individuals without the scholarship would not be able to attend college. But the other part of it is many of our student athletes are paying their own way. And we lose sight of that when we think of the high profile programs, but many of the athletes are putting in the same amount of hours, struggling, and also paying the fee bill when it comes due. So one of the things that I, I just would like to say, it's, it's a pleasure working with Bob Driscoll because I feel that like our motto of Veritas, he approaches things in an honest way. And it's a challenging, competitive way, environment we're at. But Providence College has a very good reputation. As I grew up in a neighboring state, but I knew all about Providence College athletics, first through its basketball and second through its hockey. And it was something where I always followed Providence College, even though I had no affiliation with the institution. And I knew the players, I knew the successes, and I knew the failures. So one of the things that we can be proud of as we go forward, we are the little engine, and we're the little engine that hopefully can do more and more and, and take us to a, a place of where it responds and is most respected and also very successful. So thank you very much.
And our final comments, opening comments from the panel are from Father Shanley, president of Providence College. Thank you, Lori. Um, before I offer some comments, I want to thank you all for putting this forum together. I, I've been just delighted to see the collaboration between athletics, art and art history, and the Center for Teaching, Ethelic, uh, teaching Excellence, Teaching Ethics, I was going to say. Uh, and it's really been something that has brought people together in a way that I think is emblematic of what athletics can do on uh, campus. So thank you for all your hard work. Um, from where I sit, uh, sometimes I say to myself, and I had this experience recently at the Big East meetings that we had in, in uh, concert with the tournament. And I was sitting and looking at the new schools coming into the Big East, the University of Central Florida, which has the second largest enrollment in the entire United States. There's 58,000 students at Central Florida. Uh, we have Houston coming into the Big East, huge population, close to 40,000. SMU uh, is another huge school, Boise State, San Diego State, Temple University, and they're putting all these statistics up on the board of institutional profiles. And I sit there and go, what am I doing with these people? Uh, we're just a little old school of 38, 3,900 people, and yet we compete in arguably the most arduous and difficult athletic conference in the country. And we've asked that question a lot of times as a board of trustees, both before I was president, these questions recur, and, and since I've been president. So I'd like to offer a few thoughts from, if you will, 30,000 feet about the strategic importance of athletics for Providence College going forward. I want to pick up first on something that Coach Cooley mentioned, and that is we have an aspiration to be a nationally recognized Catholic <coughs> liberal arts college. And part of that strategy for getting that national recognition is to compete in athletics at the highest level. Our ability to play in the Big East gives us a national platform for Providence College. When we beat Pittsburgh two years ago, a high point in, in our basketball history, Sports Center, first story, Providence College upsets Pittsburgh. We have the ability, if we're successful, and we will be successful in uh, basketball <laughs> going forward, during the week of March Madness for people to be talking about Providence College. It's killing me right now that people are talking about all these other schools. And I look forward to the day, Coach, uh, when people are filling out their brackets and they're going Providence College. And I can't tell you how many times when I'm traveling, and I'm always wearing, I'm a traveling advertisement for the college. I got PC everything. People come up to me, PC, you guys play basketball. So it's part of our profile that we have this kind of national recognition. And it's important for us from an admissions point of view to continue to broaden our, our profile of our admitted students. And athletics, I think, can play an important role in doing that, in branding and attracting students to Providence College. And we would not get the same bang for our buck if we weren't in a conference like the Big East. The second piece that I think is very important mm -hmm. strategically is that athletes or athletics at Providence College creates community. It creates community with our alumni. One of the main ways that our alums continue to identify with and support Providence College is through athletics. They watch how the basketball team is doing, how the hockey team is doing, how the field hockey team is doing, and there's a source of corporate pride and of identification that our alums have through athletics, and that's important for us as a college going forward. I think it creates community for our students. They get excited uh, about coming to athletic contests. Uh, I got a very poignant email from a young lady this morning, uh, and I had got an email from her dad to the same effect last week. You took a young lady and her father to the Big East Tournament, remember? Yes. And uh, this young lady told a wonderful story of how she was a new freshman on campus. And she went to some event, and it was Coach Simon, I think, that reached out to her and got her excited about Friar basketball. And she wrote how excited she's been and how much a part of her first year experience at Providence College going to the basketball games has been. And how the basketball staff invited her and her dad to come with them on the bus uh, and have that Big East experience. And the dad wrote me an email last week just singing the praises of the basketball program and saying, you should be very proud of Coach Cooley and his staff. And I was very touched by this, this sense that 
this young lady coming here, it's part of how she is connecting with Providence College is through our athletic department. And I think it's an important sense of our communal identity here at the school. I also think it helps us create community with the surrounding region. I think Providence College sports is a big part of Rhode Island, uh, if you will, ecology, and especially the basketball program. And I say that as a kid growing up who's been rooting for Providence College since I was a little kid. There's a, there's a tremendous sense of local pride in Providence College that we have here in Rhode Island. And believe me, uh, when I get into some of the political fights, I draw on that capital. Hey, we're the school that has put Rhode Island and Providence on the map because of our athletic success and especially our basketball program. But none of those goods, and I think they're all goods, would justify what we do with athletics if there weren't first and foremost an educational benefit for our student athletes. We, would, we could not justify athletics for the reasons I've just enumerated. And for me, the principal importance of athletics at Providence College is the life lessons that it provides for our student athletes. We strive on a residential campus to provide lots of extracurricular activities that we feel are vital to the maturation, the holistic maturation of our students. And athletics is one of those. And we're really extraordinary. Of 3,900 students, we have over 300 student athletes playing varsity one, division one sports. Almost 10% of our students are playing a sport here at Providence College. And they, the student athletes that you heard, are, I'm sitting there listening going, yes, this is exactly, uh, not that we put them up to say what it is that they said, but for me, that's why we have athletics at Providence College. Because our athletes learn things about life, about cooperation, about contending, about striving, about discipline that they would not learn in any other way. I do believe that athletics done rightly can teach virtues that are important for life and important for success. I remember early on in my tenure going to visit uh, the office of Mike Wayne, who is our board chair. And Mike took me around and introduced me to a lot of the people that work for him. And they told me a little bit of their background stories. And I was struck by how many of them had played sports in college. And I said to Mike at the end of this, I said, do you like athletes? Do you consciously try to hire athletes? He goes, no. He says, but my business involves competition. And I like people that are not afraid to compete. And athletics teaches you, and I think we heard this today, it teaches you the confidence of being able to compete. And whether we like it or not, competition is an important part of, of life. And I think our student athletes learn that, among many other things. So uh, I, I think at the end of the day, that has to be the primary justification for athletics. I think it, it actually helps us achieve multiple goods. And I think it's great that we're discussing this. Uh, I think it's an important topic for us to discuss. I think this is a great idea for us to be able to talk across uh, different kinds of boundaries, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. I would like to open the floor now for discussion, comments, and questions. I hope that we'll get a variety of topics uh, on the plate. And I especially want to encourage the students in our presence to, to speak up and have your voices heard and questions heard. Um, we have an extra mic that we can pass around. So please, if you do have a question, raise your hand so that we can get this on the mic and we, we're videotaping uh, to record the event. So um, anyone? <clears throat> Come on, it's your turn. Um, <clears throat> I just want to thank all of you for coming and talking to us about these uh, issues. Um, I, I obviously I'm a faculty member, so you know where I put my priorities. One of our new strategic plan has as one of its five pillars academic excellence, not athletic excellence. So how can faculty at this school look to the athletic department, the coaches, et cetera, and see them embrace that pillar, academic excellence, and instill that in the student athletes. What palpable, concrete ways is that going to happen? Anyone? Yeah, I, 
think um, I think part of that is your everyday teaching. Um, you know, part of, you know, uh, I look at it myself as a teacher, and part of our lesson plan, which would be our practice plan, is to educate our young men on how important after every practice, after every game, I always talk about being prepared for class. Understand, you know, when you go to class, you know, have a pen, have your notes. Uh, uh, you know, are you prepared for the exam that's going to be had? I think that's part of your everyday practice. And when you, when you make it a priority, when you make it part of winning and part of who you are as a coach and the leader that you're going to be, I think eventually your kids pick it up. And I, they're kids, too. I mean, I tell my son all the time, did you do your homework? Yes, Dad. You get it? You got a zero on his homework. So, you know, we, we have to understand there's going to be kids and they're learning, too. Yeah, I would echo what Ed said. I think it lives in conversation. It's something that has to be talked about every single day. It's that concept of how you do anything is how you do everything. And if you're going to be 100% all in on your sports, you need to be 100% all in on the academic side of it. The struggle, and this is not an excuse, it's a reality, is that they have almost like two full-time jobs. The amount of time they spend in the classroom and the amount of time they spend in their sports, and then you add injuries and travel, it's, it's a tough task. And so one of the things I hope was we can have a dialogue around when classes are offered, or if a student athlete is stuck between a rock and a hard place and they're on a full scholarship and they have to go someplace to compete, that the conversation with the faculty member would be a way to work together so they can get their work done and not be penalized because they have to make choices. And sometimes they have to make choices. And we're trying to teach our student athletes to be up front and have a dialogue with your professor in advance. But I think the more we collaborate, the more we talk and have the same goal of having them have a great experience, I think we can do a better job. But we need to do a better job of keeping it alive on a daily basis that they need to, they need to be focused on their academics. I think to expound on that one more piece is in the recruiting process. In the recruiting process, tell them who they're going to play for. You know, I'm a person who believes that you have to graduate. If you are a professional athlete then and you're going to leave school early, then make a promissory note to yourself, to your family. I want to graduate in X amount of time. Uh, and, you know, I think, it, again, it just builds into your everyday practice of what you want to teach. The one other thing I'll add to that is I don't think academic excellence is necessarily getting a 4.0 here. For me, I couldn't always get those grades here, but academic excellence was having teachers that encouraged me to want to keep learning and not holding me back or not punishing me because I was missing a class because I had to travel. And because I wanted to keep learning, because they had instilled that academic awareness in me, I was able to go to graduate school and really maybe get a higher level of education. So I don't think academic excellence is necessarily just learning the most you can in those four years, but rather really fostering that academic desire. I, I also found that for me, in we have a lot of different students that have different learning styles and trying to understand our students, not just our student athletes, but our student athletes' learning styles. I had the biggest fear of math in my undergrad experience, and I had a math professor that related everything to Star Trek, and it clicked for me. <laughs> so there, there were ways that teachers engaged me that I talked to, to my students about how they can engage their professor as well to create that dialogue, and I think as our student athletes become more engaged. It's very similar to on the court. They're engaged on the court in their field that they love to play in the classroom. Get them engaged. Uh, get them up. Get them moving. Um, it helps them to recall and, and have fun with class because they need to have fun in class as well. I think that's such an important factor. It was something that was uh, a winning situation for me, but understanding a, a student's learning style is really significant. I'd like to add just one more thing. You can maybe take the mic back there. But it came out in our discussions in organizing the event that a lot of uh, student athletes have a very firm identity in the athletic facilities with their own teams or their own peers. But they struggle to develop an identity in other arenas, whether it be the classroom or other social venues. And uh, as Coach Cooley said, the more that we can integrate that experience outside of the team, then we're delivering a, a more holistic experience for these students. I hope this doesn't sound sycophantic because it absolutely is not. But more often than not, my athletes in my classroom 
are the high performers, and it's exactly because of what Melissa was talking about. It's because they're disciplined. Mm -hmm. It's because they know how to allocate time. They're hardworking. They're persistent. They're determined. And I felt such pride, Melissa, when you said you were valed the valedictorian of your, your Roger Williams Law School class. I felt such pride. But my question is for Coach Cooley. I'm wondering if you were surprised by the suspicion or the cynicism that was expressed on the prof list about the possibility and, and your avowed determination to make academics more important or at least as important as athletics in the basketball program. Um, and whether or not you were surprised, how you would hope to meet faculty on its own terms around that issue? I mean, surprise, I, I, I put that pressure on myself because I feel if one of our players failed, then I have failed their parents and them. Um, and that's why we try to make it an everyday practice. When we're recruiting our players, even with, if the social component of college trumps their academic athletic commitment, then they're not going to make it. So much of my job is not just coaching the game, it's coaching these kids how to be successful in life. And in doing so, trying to get young men, uh, let's face it, some of our kids have academic challenges. And that's why I'm so happy to be here today to express to our community here, express those challenges that they may have to try to play at that highest level and compete at the national high level. There's some kids we're going to take some risks on. And we hope that we as a support staff, a support group, give them the right leadership, the right mentorship, uh, that it's an everyday practice to try to match the energy and to try to match what our professors here are trying to do with our student athletes as well. But you know, it's, it's not going to be, I'm not going to guarantee anything uh, because again, uh, when I go home at night and sometimes it's at 11, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, how they've been raised, it's tough to take an 18 years of habit and think I'm going to change it in four years or a year. You hope that, you know, there is some, uh, you know, they have some civility about themselves um, to try to become great, you know, as a student too. You know, um, so again, it goes back to the everyday practice, challenging them and having the same uh, words to them. As a longtime faculty member, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to the people on the panel who were responsible for, for some of the recent hirings uh, from an academic perspective. Um, but I was also wondering if uh, any members of the panel might have any uh, programs uh, that they might be willing to mention that they would think uh, we might emulate. I mean, I was really impressed by what Mr. Driscoll said in terms of the percentage of our graduates and things of that nature. But I'm, I'm just wondering if you could uh, speak of any other programs at other schools. Well, I, I spent 15 years at the University of California, Berkeley, and we had 1,200 student athletes in a major college football program. And much as Ed, Ed said, to, to compete at that level, you're, talk, you're taking a number of student athletes are, that are at risk. And I think one of the things that we're working on is how do you create a, a bridge program, a summer bridge program, where you can actually take real coursework, hopefully in writing, uh, so that when the courses start in the fall, they not only have units, but they're ahead of the curve. The other component has to do with the mentorship program, is when you're going to take young men and even young women, and hopefully we're going to take a small number of those so we can be successful, how do you surround them with the best advice so they're in the right courses so they can have success early on and build on that success? I don't think we, either athletics or academically, have, have done a great job of actually being prepared for at-risk student athletes, and they're in the mainstream. And I, I think this institution is probably a lot more competitive than it was 10 years ago, uh, the students coming in here. So the student athletes, I think, even have a tougher job around that. So I think we need to do a better job of, as Jonathan said, finding out what their needs are, figuring out how we support them, and then following through on that. So there are some models out there, but like anything else in the world, it costs money, it's resources, and so that's why we're trying to fundraise to get those things done. But we've made great progress, but we still have a long way to go. I'm John Scanlon in the Department of English, and I'm the pre-law advisor here as well. 
Um, I think I probably speak for a lot of people in the room when I say that listening to all of you uh, speak of the ideals um, and the integrity of academics and athletics is inspiring. And it's true that at many universities this doesn't happen. And so when I heard the stories, I mean, I think my blood, my blood beat pretty fast, and others did too. It's just wonderful to hear. But the problem is this. I think if we were, say, at Holy Cross or at Bucknell or at Vassar, schools that do not have high visibility Division I sports teams, you would have heard a lot of the same kind of stories. And so I want to kind of revisit this question of the question of branding Providence College via high visibility revenue earning sports. Here's the question, and certainly I, I defer to the research all of you have done uh, who've investigated this, but here's the question. Um, yes, one possible way of branding Providence College is to get its name out there during March Madness, having President Obama put maybe, uh, I don't know, North Carolina losing to Providence College on his bracket, right? Yeah, this would bring great visibility to Providence College. But then there are schools like Holy Cross and Bucknell that have a great deal in common, in my view, with Providence College, especially in their academic aspirations. And so I'm just wondering, what's the other side of the argument? <clears throat> in what ways might Providence College maybe move more towards a Bucknell model or a Holy Cross model. It would seem that there would be an extraordinary financial issue involved, but if we're really going to be true to a lot of the ideals of academic and athletic integrity, it would seem to me that they have good ideas as well, those kinds of schools. It's a very interesting piece. Last year in the Holy Cross magazine, they did a forum to talk about kind of the future of, of athletics. And they had alumni, they had the athletic director. And it was a very fascinating look at it. And one of the things that they said was, they're spending more not giving scholarships for football than they would be if they gave out the minimum, the required amount by the NCAA. So they talked a lot about how much you're spending on athletics, why the fact that they don't have a higher profile, how when they compete that there is the Patriot League the right league for them. So it's interesting that having this conversation. The one challenge that we have when we look at schools like Holy Cross and Bucknell is the size of their endow endowment relative to Providence College. So Holy Cross has about $210,000 per student in endowment, and we're around 34000 so that, and Bucknell, I don't know the exact numbers for Bucknell, but Bucknell is quite significant. So one of the things that they're able to do is to utilize their endowment in support of the excellence in that margin. And those are things that we're working on through institutional advancement to increase that. And we've had a lot of discussion with our trustees on how do we get that endowment into that type of ballpark. The one of the things is so, a lot of their academic success is funded out of the proceeds of their endowment, their financial aid, their packaging, and things like that come out of that purpose. So one of the challenges we have is how do we gener generate the interest, the buzz, the reputation without that significant endowment? And I think this is a, a, one of the ways that has worked well in Providence College. And Bob, Bob just has things. So. Yeah, I would echo what John said. If, if we made that decision, and it, it's, it's, those are great schools, but we generate so much money from being in the Big East and selling tickets and fundraising and corporate sponsorship that if you went into one of those leagues, there, there's no money coming our way other than maybe the tickets that you'd sell. And I think you, first of all, I don't know, I'm not sure the college could afford it. You'd still have an athletic department. You'd still have the same staff. You'd still have the same student athletes. And then you'd have to find another $10 million some way, maybe more, to figure that out. There are people knocking the doors down to try to get into the Big East right now. And I think we, as an institution, sometimes take that for granted. But it is an absolute gift that were in it. The other comment I would make, having been around at a lot of fundraisers, a lot of the fundraising that we do stems from
the Big East tournament. We were down at the Rangers game last night. These are very high profile people with great means. And when you have athletic events around it, it's a way to have these conversations that allows you to raise money. I, I think if you decided to make the decision to get out of the Big East and go someplace else, you would disenfranchise the last 50 years of alumni that really feel connected to the institution. And I think that would affect really your bottom line. Just a very quick follow-up. <clears throat> this: if, if then it's the case that the high visibility sports are really crucial to fundraising, then we're moving away from a lot of the ideals of athletics and all the rest, and we're moving into the territory that was examined by Taylor Branch in that very significant article that was published in the Atlanta a lot back, and that would seem. To Um, yours is a good, very good question, and, and it's a question that at the trustee level, my first year as president, we spent three meetings on athletics. And one of the things that we investigated would, suppose we went D3. That still is going to cost you a fair amount of money, and there's absolutely no revenue. So there's fixed costs to having athletics no matter where you play. The schools you mentioned, like Holy Cross and Bucknell, play D1. Um, so there, I think Bucknell might even, it gets in the NCAA tournament every once in a while. So they've chosen, they're going D1, not D3, not D2. Uh, bec and, but they're in a league that's not one of the power leagues like that we're in. And uh, they obviously see D1 sports as important for their institutions, but they don't want to, Holy Cross is very proud of the fact um, that they de-emphasized athletics, but they still spend a lot of money on athletics and they don't have a lot of revenue. So the schools that, that we aspire, I said at the beginning that I, I sometimes I look around the room and I go, what am I doing with these people at the Big East? And, and then I talk to the president of Georgetown and the president of Notre Dame, and I go, okay, those are two schools that are arguably among the elite institutions of this country that manage to balance big time athletics and uh, a staunch academic reputation. And I think it is possible to do both of those things, and that's what we've, uh, I think, historically thought here at Providence College is that we can use uh, our athletic reputation as a lever to help us to get better students and to get a higher institutional profile. Uh, and I would look forward to the day when I have as much money as Holy Cross and I could say, well, maybe we don't need to do that anymore. It's not the main reason for doing it, but I think that we can balance academic excellence with athletic excellence. And I think when I look at Notre Dame and I look at Georgetown and Villanova and some of the other schools that uh, we really do compete against at the high end, that uh, I feel pretty comfortable in that room and with that strategy. We have time for a few more questions and I didn't want to leave anyone out. So. As faculty member, I just am happy to have this conversation. I applaud the new initiatives, taking faculty members and assigning them to uh, athletic teams. I think it's a great idea. And I think we have to go forward a little further. I think you need to give us some corridors to walk through. And I've had these conversations with Jonathan recently about assigning academic coaches, you know, and having your student athletes see them in a comparable way to their athletic coaches, not just the advisor, that you come to, or not just those reports that go out to us maybe twice a year, by that time it's too late. But we need to have regular avenues for communication between ourselves because when we get those, those forms to fill out, everybody does it, but it's typically at midterm. And it doesn't give us the personal connection that we so need to the athletes and to the coaches. If we had an opportunity to sit down and say, this is the classroom behavior, this is what I'm observing. And to meet with a coach and to meet with a student together, it makes, it, we approach it much more holistically. And Jonathan and I have had occasion to do that and it works so much better. And I think that you need to reach out to those advisors, those faculty members that are willing to play a role in moving the athletes along in, in the same ways that you're hoping to do so, Coach Cooley. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could just, uh, I think every college team around the country um, that is currently not playing this week, last week when they were done, are currently working on next year. I will make it, and I've done it every year I've been a head coach, when our season ends, we take two, maybe three weeks 
where we don't even walk into the gym because I feel we've missed so much class time. And we've missed so much preparation time. Right now, our players know they're not going to touch a basketball for another two weeks because we feel either we're behind, uh, we need to, again, re-engage ourselves with our professors. So again, I want to continue to go back. and It's what you practice on a daily basis and then what you build as a program. Right now, I probably, where my program is from a basketball standpoint, we should practice till we're blue in the face <laughs> to prepare these guys to play in this league. But I get it. I understand where we are. And what's important for us as a whole, as a community, is to make sure that we educate them so we can attempt to do everything we can to move them forward from an academic standpoint. And I love your idea. I will support that 100%. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little embarrassing that we don't have students uh, speaking, but uh, another faculty voice. Uh, I want to first of all thank Melissa Dina, uh, Dino and uh, Kathy for um, telling your stories of being a PC student athlete. Uh, uh, quite inspiring. And, and I've got to tell you, uh, having taught here 18 years and then two other institutions for 12 other years, I agree that some of the best students that I've had were student athletes. Uh, and uh, I know how difficult it is. I'm the father of three very successful high school student athletes and uh, for whom, if it were for athletics, they wouldn't be the, the, the young women that they are. So I want to preface it by that. I do want to say I'm concerned because I have advised student athletes and had student athletes in the classroom. And I do think we, we can talk about how at PC, we're all a great family and community, and there's no separation between athletes and other students. But I got to tell you, student athletes are often ensconced into their teams and, and into their practice realms. And we're developing uh, a, a curriculum here, or, or in the process of developing one, that is going to be much more engaged, is going to take, is going to expand when students are learners. Um, uh, <coughs> from majors that have capstones that are, that are one day a week in the afternoon, often in conflict with most uh, practice schedules, to students who are fulfilling their civic engagement proficiency or their writing to proficiency in ways that will demand more of their time that can't be negotiated where they do it at 2 in the morning and, and forego sleep as, uh, uh, in order to be good students and good athletes. And I think we have to have many more conversations between academic departments and faculty and athletic departments. And maybe we need undergraduate, undergraduate students who are majors who can be liaisons to uh, athletic teams. Uh, I know when I was at Baylor, that's what we had. Uh, because uh, I advised a, a women's basketball uh, student who graduated, uh, a player who, who graduated a few years ago. And if she hadn't been injured her, the spring of her senior year, she wouldn't have been able to graduate with a political science degree because she, she wouldn't have been able to take the capstone seminar that, was, that she needed to get a major in political science. So we're, and we're probably more guilty on the faculty side because we don't care what students' needs are oftentimes when we schedule. We care about what our scheduling needs are, but we need to be able to listen and, and communicate. And I'm just concerned that there won't be communication, and as a result, students will lose out, student athletes will lose out on opportunities to engage, maybe to major in certain areas that they want to but can't because the schedule doesn't fit, and that, that we on the faculty side will lose out on the opportunity to interact in the way that we need to. So I just want us to be mindful of those things and to encourage those kind of conversations. And I guess that doesn't, that's not a question, just a comment. <laughs> Could I ask the question back, and I appreciate you bringing that up, because when push comes to shove and a student athlete's on a scholarship and the coaches, hey, you need to be there, they're, they're stuck between those two decisions. So how would you suggest we create that dialogue? And maybe, you know, we're speaking to the choir here, but what, what about the faculty members who perhaps don't feel they want to have that dialogue in terms of accommodating both needs? I mean, what would you suggest? How do we go about doing that? Well, I do think that if you had lia liaisons to the different teams that were, undergrad that were undergraduate students who were maybe majors or some way that, 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 that the faculty members who respect students who are their majors could be in conversation with, with students who also understand the needs of athletes, maybe that would help. 
Um, I think on t there have been occasions where there hasn't been a lot of openness on the part of coaches mm -hmm. to hear what the needs of faculty were. For, you know, I teach a lot of courses that have uh, service learning components to them that that students who are in different sports weren't able to accommodate schedules. And I was trying to be as accommodating as I could be, but mm -hmm. without understanding what the needs of both sides are, it's hard to, to know. I, I think just open dialogue is what I'd recommend. And, and um, sometimes there's not time on either side to do that, but maybe having liaisons who can help um, foster that dialogue would, would make a difference. That's, I don't know. That's no, thank you. Others might have other ideas. I appreciate it. Could I just w weigh in on that for a second, too? Um, I, I think, Rick, you brought up a great point, and it's one that we, that we do struggle with here. I recently, and Father Noel can probably uh, give you a little more of the color on this, we had a hockey player who wanted to be a bio major, I believe. And so the question of can you balance being a bio major with the labs and everything else with hockey? And so there is sometimes a constraint that the student athletes feel that I can only major in certain things because of my practice schedule. And I think for this to work, for to give them the opportunities that any other student would have, is going to require flexibility on both sides of the fence. Some faculty flexibility to work with students about their scheduling constraints, and some coaches flexibility about uh, practice times and things like that. And I, I see some intransigence, to be honest with you, on both sides of this. Uh, and there are some faculty that seem to be pretty proud of the fact that student athletes can't take their course because they won't allow a certain number of absences for whatever reason. And I think it's, gee, it's not fair to the student athletes sometimes. They'd like to take the course and they can't. Some professors are magnificent uh, about working with student athletes. And, and, and I think some of our coaches are more, I don't know how Coach Cooley is about this, some of our coaches are a little more flexible with their players than some others are. And I think that would be a good dialogue for us to have. And I think both sides are going to have to learn to maybe, that's one of the things I've learned is sometimes you have to give something up in, in order to meet people halfway on things. But you, you raise a very good point. I don't know if Father Noel, you wanted to weigh in. Well, I certainly couldn't top you, Father. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember that case where uh, the, um, uh, it was a men's ice hockey uh, player who, uh, and we worked, uh, I, I had about four or five meetings with the hockey coaches. We were, they were recruiting the student, and we finally worked it out for between summer work. Uh, you can take uh, general chemistry in the summer and take general biology. You know, uh, there was great flexibility on both sides, and then he came and then he changed his major. <laughs> um, but there are, you know, and I've worked with, uh, with Civ. Civ is changing now, and uh, it's so important to have you know, not all the uh, the sem these two-hour seminars at the same time. And I understand how senior faculty members, uh, you know, like to have just the right schedule for their teaching. But uh, but you know, we need morning seminars. We need afternoon seminars. We you know, evening seminars would be would be nice too. Um, we're a small school, and so all our science courses have have labs in the afternoon. And if uh, a student athlete um, who can only come to Providence College as a student athlete for all sorts of reasons, you know, if they want to be um, a, a science major, does that mean they can't be? Um, you know, so um, capstone courses. You know, a student gets through the uh, as as uh, as Rick said. You know, a capstone course. A student has worked hard uh, in their major, a political science major, or was it political science or? political science major for three years, and then they can't take their capstone course because they need to be on the... Um, so we do need... Uh, liaisons is a great idea. I, uh, I had suggested to the athletic department that, that uh, coaches who see uh, a lot of their student athletes in particular majors to reach out... We, the uh, academics get their schedules uh, ready, um, I think, two years in advance. You know, I need to let my chair know when I'm teaching or, 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 or um, he needs to send in the, the uh, teaching schedule in uh, one or at least a year ahead of time. So, so that's the sort of thing that's, uh, if the coaches can be the liaison, but student athletes being the liaison themselves, that would be great too. I would, Father, I was just going to make another comment that actually Jill and I started this conversation earlier this year trying to identify with this capstone. You know, we don't, as you're saying, 
we're not that big a school and the number, see where the majors are and um, see if we can identify where there might be some problems and work through that before, you know, to make it solvable. So, and I would be happy to, in an academic advising office, um, try to start working on some of these suggested programs. I think they're great. Hi, I'm John Hennedy from the English Department. Uh, I, ha I have another uh, quick example along the same lines. I had a, one of the best students I ever had in Shakespeare, and I asked her why she wasn't an honor student, and she told me that her coach wouldn't allow her to be. And the, we have honors uh, seminars in the afternoon, but only one day a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I might be, uh, I think maybe the coaches could be a little more flexible on that one. I agree with you. Um, you know, we had players this year that had to leave practice early. Uh, sometimes I tell them don't even come to practice. Um, and again, the, the, the tough part of that is at the end of the day, we're all kumbaya. At the end of the day, Ed Cooley has to win basketball games. And I understand that. And, that's, and I love that challenge. But as someone who gets it, sometimes we of people don't get the ultimate it. I'm one that does because I believe in both sides. But I believe more on the educational component because at the end of the day, the ball, the, the air is going to come out of that ball. And who are you? What have you learned and what have you become? I get that. I'm on that note, I would like to uh, stress this idea of who are you? How do you build an identity? And how do we as a college build an identity of constantly striving for excellence in everything that we do? So I think we've all seen the avenues for further discussion and coordination and cooperation. And it's incumbent on all of us, I think, individually to step up to the plate and um, continue this conversation over food and on into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.